Thanks for coming up here, guys. So did you guys like the choir? Did they do a nice job? Yeah. So one of the cool things about going to Martin Luther College, just up the hill, is that you could be in one of the choirs. So that's a pretty cool thing. So you guys should think about that. All right, other reasons to go there too, not just to be in the choir. But um, brought a book here today that one of our members made. There are four books of these. And what are, do you guys know what these are? What are those? Yes. Yeah, stones that when they're dead, they just go under there. So when um, somebody dies, when one of our loved ones dies, we usually have a funeral, and then we'll go out to the, either with an urn or a casket, we'll go out to the, the cemetery or the graveyard, and they, we put their body in the ground, and then we put a marker or a gravestone, or sometimes called a tombstone, like outside of a tomb, um, and it says who they are, when they lived. So you see the years there on the bottom? You know, that person died in 1953. That's before we were born, you know? Um, but this is, uh, but are those bodies going to stay there forever? No. One of the nice things, cool things that Jesus shows us today with his words and also with his powerful actions, he shows us that the grave is not the end for us. You know, when we die, our souls go to heaven and our bodies go, you know, in the ground, in a grave or an urn. And then when Jesus comes back on the last day, he raises our bodies and he glorifies our bodies so that they can be reunited with our soul. And then we get to be in heaven, body and soul, with him for all eternity. So that's kind of cool. So even though this sometimes makes us sad to think about gravestones or loved ones being out in the cemetery, that's not the end. We get to be in heaven with Jesus, and these bodies will be raised. So let's pray and thank Jesus for that. Dear Jesus, thank you for uh, living for us, dying on the cross to take away our sins, and then also rising from the grave. And thank you for raising many people uh, throughout the scriptures, and also Lazarus, as we see today, to show us that you have power over life and death, and you will raise us too. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, what we speak about today is a rather difficult subject. Um, here in New Ulm, in our context, uh, usually when a, a loved one gets sick or is uh, looking like they might die, emergency services are called, and they do as much as humanly possible uh, to help the person. But if it ends in death, or even if the death was something that was expected or even prayed for in some cases, um, the shock may be less, but the difficulty still remains. And then when that happens, when death happens, a, a new path is made for the survivor survivors of that loved one for them to make decisions, to make choices. It starts out simply with usually, you know, what funeral home would you like us to call? Or is there someone we can call? And then maybe um, when the funeral home gets involved, they take care of the body with great respect and honor. And then, you know, the, a, a pastor or a church is called. And then a meeting is set. And during this meeting, whether the next day or a few days later, uh, what often happens is a whole new line of questions with decisions that have to be made. And not a whole lot of choices, but you make them. And some of these choices are things like, you know, will it be a casket or an urn? And if so, what will the loved one be dressed in? Um, and these are difficult things to go through. And also, you know, while someone's in the fog of, of grief and this difficulty, and that's nowadays. I imagine it was just as difficult for Mary and Martha as their brother Lazarus grew sick and they sent word to Jesus for help. They sent for the best emergency service, but then Lazarus died. And by the time Jesus arrived, he'd already been in the tomb four days. Whether it's back 2,000 years ago in, in the context of Bethany or, or here today in our context, the Lord has something to teach us and show us today. Believe and see the glory of God. Please stand for the gospel lesson. John chapter 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. 
Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I, heard that you, I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem, everything had already been set in motion, all the decisions had been made, and this was just the aftermath. The, the days of mourning appointed to mourn for a loved one. And Mary and Martha hear that Jesus has come, and Martha runs out to meet him, doesn't even make it to the house or, or where they are, but she comes out to meet him. And this is a woman who had full faith and confidence in Jesus. You know, she has a, a, a confession that rivals the Apostle Peter's. I mean, if you think about it, and also in just having gone through a traumatic event makes this confession all the more amazing. You know, that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus had turned water into wine in front of his disciples. He had, he had um, given sight to the blind, healed people of re leprosy, shown... Um, that, that he knew what was in the hearts of people, and he did all these amazing things. Even sent word, when he heard that a, a centurion servant was sick, he sent word to heal the man, or said, you know, your servant will be healed, and doesn't even end up going to the house, and the servant is healed. But when he gets word that his good friend from this family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who often put them up when they were in Bethany, who provided meals for them and supported their ministry and the disciples. When, when he hears and gets word that Lazarus is sick, we don't hear about a word being sent. We don't hear about Gehazi, the servant, being sent ahead with a staff, as Mr. Cushel read to us from 2 Kings. We don't, we don't hear any of that. And then four days after he's been in the tomb, dead, all the things have been done, he's in the tomb, it's closed, then Jesus arrives. And Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Was she wrong? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Mary gets to Jesus a little bit later on, she says the exact same thing, like they had been thinking this, if not speaking about this, and I don't think they were wrong. Jesus can handle, you know, our words, our struggles. He can handle when we speak to him and, and we pour our hearts out to him. He could handle it when Mary and Martha did this as well. Martha believed in him. She had a great confession of faith. She shows that she has full confidence in him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. What was, he, what was she thinking he would ask for? Because he says, you know, to her, you know, I, I am the resurrection and the life. And she still doesn't seem to 
grasp completely what he's trying to say to her or who he truly is. She knows he's the Son of God. She knows he's the Savior. But Jesus is going to help her understand. Do we underestimate Jesus? All of us believe in Jesus as our Savior from sin. That's why we're here. But do we underestimate him? And I'd say as sinful human beings, how can we not? We like to think we don't, but then sometimes when we pray hard for things, for the, the, the difficult situation to be reversed, from the burden to be taken from us, from that person we love to not be so sick or to not die, but then they die, uh, the burden remains, and difficulties come one after the other in our life. How do we feel? Sometimes I think we end up like the, the youth who, in a, maybe a conversation with their parents, when they don't get what they want, or in the timetable that they want, like right now, then they end up with this thought, and maybe even verbalize it. Well, if you're not going to give this to me, then you don't love me. Have any of you ever used that one on your parents? You know, whatever the little thing or big thing might have been. But I think we do this to our God. The way we sometimes react to him, the way we sometimes are cold to him, the, the way we sometimes doubt him or, 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 or have a difficult time trusting him or even coming to him. And then there are the times where we just simply don't even want to think about him and we run to get what we want in the way we want it, when we want it, even if it's a sinful thing. Because we don't want to trust the Lord's plan or trust that everything he allows, everything he gives is for our good. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha, I think, does better than most of us in just that wonderful confession of faith. And she's saying this, and it hurts, but she knows if Jesus had been there, he wouldn't have died, but now he's dead. But I still trust in you. I still believe in you. But Jesus is going to help her understand even more how much she can trust him. He's going to show her. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he goes on, and we hear this. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. You can picture it. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. And we would say, thank you, Martha. Finally talking some sense into Jesus. No one wants to relive the trauma of what they've just been through. Could you imagine that? Taking away the stone. You think of all the things that went into that, all the decisions that had to be made, and they were finally done with it. No doubt the sisters may have been the last to see the body of their beloved brother and, and, and wrapped his body and, and cleaned it, wrapped it, and then put the spices all around it, and then had help in closing the tomb after one last look, and then it was done. And now Jesus wants to rip that wound right open again. Jesus was always doing stuff like this that just seemed to make no sense. Take those six huge jars, fill them with water. And yes, I know the, 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 the master of the banquet is looking for wine, but take some of this water to him. We think, what in the world is Jesus doing? Or Jesus, you know, have some tact. There's a funeral procession in its route. Just stand by and let it go by. But you go up and you stop and you touch the casket or the beer that the body is on. And you say to this widow who's lost her only son, pain upon pain, and you say, don't weep. What in all the world are you doing, Jesus? He was constantly doing things like this. And finally, Martha talked some sense into him as Peter once tried to talk sense into him, and as others tried to talk sense into him. You know, who touched you, Lord? Well, there's a crowd pressing in around you. How in all the world would we know? But Jesus is helping them. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You can't talk sense into Jesus. You can't talk sense into Jesus, at least our sense, the way we think, with our limitations, with, with the, the limits we put on God. We sometimes bring Jesus down because we know he's true man and we love that, that we can relate to him and that he can relate to us. He suffered through many things. He was tempted just as we are, yet was without sin. But sometimes we bring him down in our minds to think that, you know what, he acts just like us. 
or he's limited just like us, and we don't understand, but Jesus here draws us out as he draws out Martha to help her understand and to help you and me understand who he is and what that means. We see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, he's not asking for permission or help. He, too, is true God in the flesh, in perfect unity with the Father. When, Jesus, when, he, had said, or when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. An impossible demand. There is no sense in this, except that Jesus is the impossible. True God in the flesh. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is who Jesus is. He is the resurrection and the life. If he wants to, he can do this. And why does he want to? It's because, I mean, he, there's a whole book here. This is one of four books. Just no spaces, no explanations, just gravestone after gravestone, multiple names on them. Some people that you know who have died. And this isn't even all the people we know that have died. But he raises this man. And to the shock of people, and he even has to explain it because they're so shocked. He often does this, you know, when he raised that girl, he says, give her something to eat. She's probably hungry. You know, he's standing there. Lazarus is standing there. Jesus knows he's alive. He's well. He's fine. Why don't you guys take off the grave clothes and let him go? Like, helps them along. He's really alive. This is what this means. But this is who he is. The impossible who does the impossible for us. If you believe, or he says, so that you believe. Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? And now they see it. And Martha has a better understanding. That when the doubts and temptations come to us to look at Jesus and limit him in what he can do for us. Or limit him that what he's doing isn't good for us. Or won't be a blessing in the long run. Or for that loved one. We sit down and we think about this and we trust. We know God's plan is greater than our plan. And his plan is perfect even when he allows these struggles to remain, even when he allows disease, even when he allows difficulty in our lives, or that pestering thing that keeps pestering us, or even death itself. Believe and see the glory of God. Jesus isn't ignorant of your struggle, your pain, ignorant of all these people who have died, and the many more. He knows this. And what he shows us here is that he loves us. We hear this in this, if you read the whole account in, in John chapter 11. The one you love is sick. Jesus loved them. And that, when he says it, it's that agape love, that self-sacrificing love. And even when Jesus acts strangely in our lives, that's not in question. Jesus does love us. Jesus has allowed it. Why? He knows. And we believe and we will see the glory of God. Stand in awe and amazement at what he has done, but then stand in awe and amazement as you realize where he is and what he's doing. People were already trying to kill him. They were already plotting and planning this. And we hear the reaction to Jesus raising this man from the dead goes two ways. Some were overjoyed and put their trust in him, and then some wanted to kill him all the more and set into motion things that would not be reversed. And Jesus then willingly walks to that cross, knowing what was coming for him. And on that cross, Jesus, in love for you and me, suffers for all of our sins, all of our misdeeds, all of our missteps, the times we've doubted him, our petty thoughts. If you don't do this for me, Lord, then you don't love me. He died for that too. So you and I are completely and fully forgiven because of Jesus' blood shed on the cross, and then he died and was laid in a tomb for you and for me. This week, we're approaching next week, this last midweek Lenten service, and then Palm Sunday, and then we walk to the cross with Jesus. And we will see the glory of God. All for you, all for me. 
Believe and you will see the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.